Nocturnal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Well, good evening. We just have a wonderful, wonderful group of family here tonight, and it's always exciting for me because you know, when you talk to a camera, you just don't know who's on the other side. And the nice thing about these groups is yeah, I know who's on the other side. It's, I, it's a wonderful experience for me, and I hope it is for all of you. You know there's one thing that man lives by, at least much of the time, tries to explain, writes poetry about, books, articles, and that's love, we, you know. But I'm wondering if we really know what it is. Uh, to love some is a feeling, you know, you go, woo. <laughs> <laughs> Well, then it's gone, you see, that doesn't, that doesn't last long. And some, their eyes get all glassy and, and uh, you say, oh, you know. And uh, some feel that it's a, a feeling, and it is. But I wondered, uh, for a few days anyway, what does the scripture say love is? And why is it today that we talk a lot about it, but there's a tremendous amount of divorces in the world today? And so you got to ask yourself, I think we all do, what is love? Is it only a feeling? Well, you know, some days you feel good, some days you feel rotten. Sometimes you wake up feeling rotten. And so that can't be love because it keeps coming and going. It's like a yo-yo. It's up and it's down. And Now the new commandment says that I should love you like God loves me. Oh, wow. <laughs> I don't know how I can do that, you see. But it's a commandment. It means we have to try to, um, to love like God loves me. So I, I would like to take the 13th chapter of um, Corinthians and see what the scripture says love is. You know, we used to have the Portiocula indulgence here in the beginning when we hear, we hear now, let's see how many years is it? It's 37 years. We're considered Southerners now after 37 years. I haven't got the accent yet, but uh, <laughs> I have to work on it. Um, so this indulgence, people came in as many times as they wanted and said, Six Our Fathers, Hail Marys, and Glorious. And we had hundreds of people here. And we were out at the time, and I, my ears start hurting from, la from smiling so much all day. I smiled at everybody. I shook hands with everybody. They went in and out, and I went too. And 
by the nighttime, my ears were hurt. And they were hurting because if I smile, my ears go backwards. <laughs> and everybody looks at me like I'm, I'm kind of a freak, you see, because they say, how you do that? And I said, I don't try, it just happens. And they, they try to make their ears go back and nothing happens. And the kids, you know, they get so frustrated. They'll just look at me and say, do that again. And uh, so my glasses go back and everything. So what kind of ears I got, I don't know. But my ears hurt. And here I was smiling all day. See, we can't even smile all day with some kind of pain. And that's the way our lives is. You see, our life is filled with that, and, and we don't know. We, that's why we cannot depend on feelings to love. And so I got this idea this morning when we have lesson for the sisters of trying to find out, well, what is love anyway? So I'm going to go over this, and, and I hope we all enjoy it. Now, St. Paul says something very beautiful here. He tells us what wonderful things we may have or possess, but if we don't have love, it's a nothing. But that's hard to understand. He said, if I had the eloquence of men or angels, and angels, but speak without love, I'm a symbol crashing. Now just think what he's saying. I'd love to have the tongue of angels. Wow. I'd run around scaring people half to death. <laughs> so they'd stop acting so stupid, you know, and going around committing one sin after another and don't seem to have any sin. But see, that would not be with love. And I don't know what angels look like. I got a pretty good idea, but there's not these little lovey-dovey, new age, uh, you know, the angels you see today are kind of wishy-washy, you know, the little cherubs and, oh. <laughs> you know, they, I mean, they look, they look silly, you know, they don't, they don't even look good, they're just kind of, <laughs> well, you just wonder, you know, what the idea, in our, in that new church we're building, uh, um, we got angels that are angels, see, and, and they look like angels. They're not these little things you see. And they're always together, half naked, or pretty well naked, always looking at each other like this. You know, but that's not an angel. I don't know what it is, but it's not an angel. But if I had the, the power of uh, Bishop Sheen, for example, and the mind of Thomas Aquinas, wow, huh? Wouldn't we do something? But he says here that if I had that without love, it wouldn't be a thing. Isn't that surprising? Wouldn't be a thing. And then he says, if I had the gift of prophecy, a lot of that going around today. Somebody called me up today and said, to, on the Feast of the Ascension, now I heard that the... the, the some big comet's coming, and I said, oh, for goodness sakes, who told you that? But here it is. Now, if I had the gift of prophecy and I could tell you everything is going to happen in the next three years, well, that'd be kind of nice, maybe. And I have understood all the mysteries they are. For example, if I could understand the mystery of the Trinity, how God is eternal, there was never a moment he was not. If I could explain to you how the world was created, see, and the first day, well, that would be awesome. Awesome. I'd love that. But if I had it without love, see, it wouldn't mean a thing. Not a thing. Well, it says here, if I knew everything. Now, some people think they know everything. 
That means they don't know anything. But if I knew everything there was to know, for example, uh, I have to go through this book page by page by page by page. And then I retain some, some I forget. An angel could go like this, boom, he's got the whole thing. <laughs> and that make you feel dumb. <laughs> but see, if I could do that, but I didn't have any love, it wouldn't mean a thing. See? Mm. If I had the faith in all its fullness, it could move a mountain. But without love, I'm nothing. Reminds me of that old lady who lived at the bottom of a mountain in the valley, and she didn't like the mountain. She couldn't see the sunrise. By the time she ran up the mountain, it was already risen. And so she always got mad every morning. So she's reading the scriptures, and she read this passage, and she thought, uh-huh, I can move it. If I had faith, the Lord said I'd move this mountain. Then I don't have to worry about running up and trying to catch the sun every morning. And so she did. She prayed and prayed and went to bed in peace. And she got up early in the morning, and there was the mountain. She looked out the window and she said, that's what I thought. <laughs> she didn't have any faith, you see. But if I had the faith that I could say to this little daddy mountain right behind us here, I'd say, move. What'd scare you to death, wouldn't it? Scare me to death, too. <laughs> I'd be the first one running. <laughs> but you see, if I did that, though, without love, it wouldn't mean a thing. Not a thing. In fact, St. Paul says here, it would be nothing. Hmm. Now, if I gave away all I possess piece by piece, now that's, that's a lot. But I didn't do it for love. It's nothing. And this is one of the things that it got me. It said, if I take, let them take my body to burn it. You know, there's nothing worse than a burn. You burn yourself in the oven uh, with a match or whatever. And it's so painful. Like these little paper, you know, you lick a, an envelope. You shouldn't lick it anyway, but we do. And you, you cut your tongue on paper. Paper cuts are so painful, little things like that. But, see, if I did that without love, it's nothing. So you got to ask yourself, okay, now I've had all these things and I didn't love. Well, what is love? Well, let me read what St. Paul says here. Huh? He said, love is always patient and kind. Whew. And I'm 70, it'll be 76 in April. I told you, but I'm going to tell you again. It's April 20th, in case you want to send me a card or something. <laughs> but if on that day I, I did not love, see, I wasn't grateful, and I didn't love from my heart, it being 76 is absolutely nothing. Nothing. You could say, well, you got a lot of experience, yeah, a little bit, you know, yeah. But see, none of that would mean anything either. Love makes the difference because it is willing to sacrifice. That's why there's so many divorces today. There's no spirit of sacrifice and love for better or worse. And here's what love is. Love is never jealous. Never. You know what jealousy is? Jealousy, I think, was the first sin. Everybody thinks Satan was proud. No, I think he was jealous, and then he was proud. That's my opinion. You're not going to find it in the scriptures anywhere. 
but I think because he was jealous of God's position. He was jealous of the eternal word becoming man. He was jealous of the fact he would have to worship his mother. And he said, I shall ascend to the throne of the most high God. Oh, hey, wait a minute. It, it wasn't, I don't think it was pride yet. It was jealous. He was jealous of God's position. Forgetting he's a creature. Today, a lot of people forget they're creatures of God. They're not God. You see these ads in these crazy magazines? I don't know if you get crazy magazines. I get them by the dozen every day. It's one magazine that's feel like God and be God. I looked at it and said, she had to weigh this goddess, whatever she was, at least 500 pounds. I never did see the chair she was sitting on. <laughs> and I thought, she's a goddess. I must take two people to get her off that chair. She couldn't possibly get off of it on her own. Couldn't. See, it's so, it's so stupid. But that's jealousy. We don't want to think that we're dependent upon God. We want to be. No, you're not God. You're a creature. You're going back to the earth from which you came. One day, God will raise you up. You're going to be very beautiful or exceptionally ugly. But we are not like, it's, it's never jealous. It is never boastful or conceited. Conceited people are funny, don't you think? They look funny. Like, ooh. <laughs> There's nobody like me. Oh, yes, there is. <laughs> and they're better than you. <coughs> but see, we, we are so, by nature almost, we're jealous. We think that the house you just bought, you shouldn't have. It really should be mine. That's jealousy. I envy, then, what God gives to others. You hear something, oh, I wish I were beautiful. Hey, you're not. <laughs> okay? You can be holy, though. That's, that's a rare form of beauty, holiness. See, we, we have to understand that it doesn't matter how you look. It doesn't matter. It matters where your heart is. And do you accept the will of God? Now, he goes on and he says, it does not take offense. It is never rude or selfish. Oh, the kids today are rude. When I was in Europe and uh, had these, what do you call these? Uh, things you go through and they go around. Well, these kids would not let me in. I mean, at the time I had my crutches and braces and I was afraid to go in because I almost got in and they started going faster. That's rude. That's rudeness of the worst kind. And, and you see that today. A woman goes in the bus, all the men are sitting, she's standing. Well, of course, if she wants to act like a man, then she should stand. <laughs> if you want to be an electrician and climb a pole, fine, then stand. If you look like a man, then stand like one. You see, you, you make yourself into what you don't want to be. And so they're rude. And love is never selfish. Yeah, there's a lot of that, huh? Somebody offers you a, a piece of pie, and you take the biggest piece. You're looking around. That's the biggest piece. It's almost a quarter of the pie. 
So you haven't thought of anybody else. Okay. Your mother passes me the table, you take two thirds of it. That's selfish. You don't care about anybody else. See? Selfishness is not loving. You see why? Because if you love, you think of others first, and then you take what's left. We don't think of those things. We don't have basic values or basic virtues. And St. Paul says none of that is love. He says it takes no pleasure in other people's sins. Oh, wow. Do you do that? You don't like somebody, and you hear they broke a leg. Good for them. They deserved it. <laughs> oh, wow. I told you about the woman whose husband was terrible. He stepped out on her. He went all the, I mean, he did everything a man could do. He's in the hospital a couple of weeks. The priest comes here, she's confession, baptizes him. He was never baptized. He gets the last sacrament, he's confirmed, and he dies. What was she mad? <laughs> she was furious. So I, I said to her, she came and told me all these good things that happened to her husband. I said, well, isn't that wonderful? She said, no. Should you realize She's looking at me. She realized you could have gone straight to heaven. I said, yeah, that rat. <laughs> said, wait, wait a minute now. <laughs> and she was angry. She said, I just want him to go to purgatory. <clears throat> to the end of time, he ought to be there. What happens? He gets all the sacraments and goes straight to heaven. I said, well, maybe he didn't go straight to heaven. I hope not. Well, you see, there's something wrong with that kind of love, don't you think? I mean, it's selfish, it's rude. It takes offense. Because God was so good and converted him. And gave him all the sacraments. And baptized him. See, that's not love. You see that? It's not love at all. Well, now it is always ready to excuse. Oh, we don't do that, do we? Mm -mm. We rash judge instead. We don't excuse anybody. We don't say, well, you know, he's that kind of grouchy today. Maybe he didn't sleep last night. Or maybe he's got a headache. We don't excuse people. We just... Rub it in a little bit. And see, that's not loving. St. Paul says here that love trusts, hopes, and endures whatever comes. Oh, no, we, we don't love, do we? We don't always endure whatever comes. We don't endure. We don't mind a little cross now and then. But we get tired of them. Don't we get tired of them? Huh? What makes you disheartened so much? Just because a doctor comes along and says, well, we just can't seem to do anything for that back of yours. And you say, well, you mean I'm going to have this pain a long time? It's what I'm afraid so. And what do we do then? The love endures and says, well, Lord, give me strength, give me energy, give me love. Okay? Now, he says, love does not come to an end. Now, that's a good examination of conscience for Lent. How many people have you loved? How many friends have you loved? And you don't love them anymore. Now, if I have to love like God loves, and that's the new commandment, I got to love you always. 
never stop you, no matter what you do. And that's what St. Paul says here. If there are gifts of prophecy, the time will come and they're going to fail. If you have the gift of languages, it won't continue forever. The time will come when all must fail. I've said this a hundred times, that you buy a car, you drive it home, drive it back, you lost a thousand dollars. Can you beat that? If you brought it back, you would have lost a thousand dollars. Nothing. You know what I like to see? It's a real meditation for me. You see these big flatbed trucks down the highway, and they're piled with car after car. All the cars are about um, this big. they are all been... <laughs> Now, can you imagine those in a nice window, sharp, shiny, and you paid $50,000 for it, or 20? Now look at it, rusted, squashed, going to be melted over for somebody else to pay twenty, thirty thousand $30,000 for. <laughs> Where is it now? You know, some of you kids put your heart in that little car or big car. And that's good. It's a convenience. You can drive around and go where you want to go. But the heart cannot be there. Because it's go I guarantee it's going to be on that flat bed truck about 10 years from now. You put your heart in. Some of you have sold your soul for a car. And it's going to go. It's not going to last. Now, our knowledge is imperfect, our prophesy is imperfect, and it's all going to disappear. You say, Dad, this is a gross program. <laughs> but you see, my friends, we have to understand that, otherwise we get attached we get attached to things that are going to pass. We have to use things. But we cannot be attached to things. That's where love comes in. The wrong kind of love. I cannot be attached to a car. We bought a car one time and the seat belt didn't work. Now, you can't drive without a seatbelt, so they find you, they're going to give you a ticket or something. While you look at the policeman, you say, my seatbelt is stuck. He said, well, get it fixed. Here's your ticket. Thanks a lot. <laughs> you go to the man there, and he has to take part of the car apart to get his seatbelt. So you wait three days, and then here comes the car. And there's the seat belt, all nice, shiny, and fixed. A little wrinkle here and there, but it's fixed. Three days later, you can't get it up again. <sighs> Can you imagine getting frustrated over a seat belt that refuses to move? So what do you do? You just sit in the back. <laughs> They make any sense? So why get attached to a car? They won't even let you have a seat belt. <laughs> and we do things like that. We get attached to Hondas and these motorcycles that, <sighs> bicycles and scooters and roller skates and <sighs> cigarettes. Oh boy, they're expensive, huh? Now you're dumber for buying them because <laughs> You're spending all that money. Not only does it fill your lungs with all kind of black stuff we call tar, but now you've got to pay more to get lung cancer. <laughs> now, is that love? No, it's not love. It's love for cigarettes, but that's kind of dumb. Imagine paying to get lung cancer. Now, that doesn't make any sense to me. But you'll do it. Why? Because you love 
smoke. I saw somebody at a uh, restaurant the other day, and uh, they were smoking with the left hand, eating with the right hand, and reading with their eyes on a book. Well, I, I, I just had to watch because I couldn't figure out which hand was going up first. Well, it was the cigarette, the food. I never saw the smoke come out. Isn't it supposed to? <laughs> huh? It's supposed to come out? I never saw it come out because she stuffed food in her mouth, made it come out of her nose. I don't know, but I never saw the smoke come out. I thought, now that's what you call getting all your worth out of a cigarette. <laughs> because I never saw the smoke come out. It must have been building up inside here somewhere. Or the food just went, <laughs> down went the smoke. I was fascinated, absolutely fascinated of how, I expected it to come out of her ears at any moment. Because <laughs> I thought to myself, it has to go somewhere. It has to come out somehow. But I watched her almost the entire meal. Hardly ate myself. <laughs> she got up, paid her check. I never saw the smoke. <laughs> Why don't you try it? I mean, you get your money's worth. <laughs> now, he says, when I was a child, I used to talk like a child. Some of us still do. I thought like a child, but don't we? If we do that, I think we're talking and acting like a child. Argue like a child, oh boy. But now he says, I'm a man, I put away these childish things. And so let's ask ourselves today, this evening, tomorrow, do I really? Love. Do I love those who hate me? Do I love those <coughs> who speak ill of me? The gospel these days has been to forgive seven times, seven times a day. Oh, we forget that. <laughs> seven, I have to forgive you. Seventy times, seven times a day, 24 hours. I think it's nice with daylight time, you got an extra hour <laughs> to figure out who you can forgive. That's love. If you refuse to forgive, you don't love. That's pretty obvious. See? Love is to be kind to be thoughtful, to be unselfish, to think of your neighbor first and then yourself, not to be rude. I had a man tell me the other day, Mother, this man was talking to me, and, and he said to me, wow. I said, wow, what? He said, you should hear that man when you're not around. I said, really? What's he do? She says, he swears like a pirate. I say, he's never sworn in front of me. That's what's so wonderful, he says. Well, I appreciate the compliment, but why should we swear at all? That's not to love. If you take the Lord's name in vain, that's not to love him. You never take someone you love's name in vain. You would never swear by your mother or swear by your husband or swear by your, your children. You wouldn't do that. See, it's, it's so bad, so bad that we don't know how to love. None of that is loving. So why don't you tonight or tomorrow over the weekend Look at the 13th chapter, 1 Corinthians. And go slow at it. 
and ask yourself the also question, do I really know how to love? Do you talk nasty to your wife or your children? That's not love. Are you forever upset about something? That's not love. Do you swear, take the Lord's name in vain? That's not love. I think some of you men think it's manly to swear. I think it's, it thinks, I think it shows your vocabulary is very poor. You don't know what else to say, but you swear. How can you take God's name in vain and then say, I love him? That doesn't work. How can you abuse your wife or your children and then say, I love you? That doesn't work. See, now you can be very bright and you can be very smart and you can be a genius and you can have a high IQ. You can prophesy and have them all come out right. You can have the faith that moves mountains, but if you don't love your neighbor, it's a big, fat zilcho. That's how God looks at it. So I think it would be nice for Lent. Examine your conscience. Do you really love your wife? Do you really love your husband? Or do you wish every morning they'd break a leg? You don't love them, see? You, you don't love. So, we have some calls. Hello? Hi, Mother. Hi, actually, where I are think you from? I'm your first caller. Um, actually, I won $100 at Bingo, and I'm donating $10 to your network. Wonderful. So, I wanted to tell you that. Um, my question is if you're making a decision in your life and you want God to help you, how do you know that the decision you made is the one that God wanted you to do? And if something goes wrong where it's not all right, does that mean that you? didn't do the right decision that God wanted you to do. Thank you, and God bless. <laughs> well, that's a $65 question, isn't it? Well, let me say this. When we pray, we first have to ask our dear Lord that we know his will. You see? Before God's will is done, we should know what it is, and he will let us know. And we can tell if what I'm going to do or the decision I'm going to make, is it for the honor and glory of God? Is it for the good of my family? Is it for my good? If we can say yes to all those, and I feel comfortable with it, I feel comfortable with it, then I can, I can do whatever it is I think I should be doing. And if you say, well, it doesn't go well, you know, I don't think every time we pray, we should expect everything to go well. I think sometimes that has to go sour. I, I never learned anything in success. I'm happy about it. I want to be successful for the good of the Lord's kingdom and the church and the people. But I never learn anything when I'm successful. I learn something when I fail. One time I went to a meeting of uh, Catholic uh, communicators. This is like years and years and years ago. And I was asked to give a talk on how we started and all. And, and somebody said to me, Mother, what happens if you fail? <laughs> I said, I don't. I'm not afraid to fail. Because I've always learned something when I failed. I said, I'll tell you what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid of success. Though I need to succeed. Because many people change when they're successful. You all know people that change. They get snooty and, and they get smart aleck and they get proud and arrogant and you got to be strong to be successful and keep, keep your hand on the plow. And I said to them, I'll tell you what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid of dying. And had the father look at me and 
say Angelica. All these you might have saved had you trusted more. I'm afraid of that. I take all kind of risks. We take risks nobody would even think of. If we find that we find and feel that this is God's will for us. You gotta know that first. And after that, you go and you do what you feel is God's will for you, and if you succeed, wonderful, and you fail, praise God. And you'll learn when you fail. I always learn. I learn what not to do. You're humbled when you fail. It's not bad to fail. So what? Try again. So I would not look at God and his, our prayer and our petitions as something that has to go and has to be right and has to be successful. You know, the greatest days of my life is when I had braces and crutches. I don't have them now, thank God. It's been a year. Our Lady healed me. But I felt then I was a real witness. And now I feel I'm still a witness. Because people come up to, are you still walking? I said, I think so. I got ordinary shoes on. See, the only thing in our life is, am I loving the Lord? And am, am I getting holy? That's the only thing important. See, if we're sick or healthy or wealthy or poor, or none of that is important. The thing is, am I growing holy every day? That's all important. So don't be afraid. Say, oh, I got to be a success. So well, who said that? Who said? Maybe a failure is the best thing ever happened to you. How many of you who failed or got slapped in bed in a, hotel, in, in a hospital didn't get closer to God? And you've been goofing off all your life. All of a sudden, you're in a horizontal position. Boy, you're thinking straight. <laughs> you call that a failure? I call it a great success. So don't be afraid to pray and get a no. <laughs> Maybe the best thing. Some of you women, have you ever seen now the man you almost married? <laughs> huh? Yeah? Uh-huh. Aren't you glad <laughs> you didn't? Now, at the time, you thought, oh, woe is me. He married somebody else. Now you're so happy about it. <laughs> See? Now, what you called a failure 10 years ago is really a blessing. <laughs> right? Well, so I, you pray with total confidence and trust in God. Be at peace. We have another call. Hello? Hi, Mother. Hi. Where this are you This is from? John Rivera from Omaha. Good evening. We love you very much. And, uh, Thank you. Uh, we, I cannot believe I'm talking to a very famous person. Uh, Mother, this is my question. Uh, we say that God is love. Right. And uh, why is God say that I am a jealous God <laughs> in the Old Testament? Okay, Another yeah. thing, Mother, is that do you have already a lot of sisters and can you um, put another branch there in uh, South America or another Bible birth place? Well, we have a network all over South America. But let me explain the jealous God. God is not jealous of us like we're jealous of each other. Because when we're jealous, we feel we lack something that somebody else possesses. God lacks nothing. God is not jealous for his sake, but for our sake. He knows what we miss when we love creatures or things or ourselves more than him. It's a compassion that God has for us. That God loves me with an infinite love, and he knows what I'm going to miss if I turn against him. 
and he feels very bad about that. That's the kind of jealousy God possesses. Our jealousy is mean, judgmental, angry, and covetous. Oh, that's a big difference. God cannot be any of those things. God is love. And he knows what we're going to suffer if we don't love him with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the scripture says, I am a jealous God. Well, it's not the kind we have. The kind we have is sinful. And God is holy and pure and totally without sin. He cannot sin. Because the Holy One. Okay. So you have to understand that our dear Lord is grieved when we turn against him because he knows how much we will suffer. And his love for us is so great, even if we don't love him. His love for us is so great that he feels so bad. He feels so compassionate for our stupidities. See? And so we need to know that our first love is always our love of God. And sometimes we have to give up a lot of things to prove that we love the Lord. So I want you to, to know that Lent is a very, should be a joy-filled time because now I have many graces and I can then change, really have a, a conversion a real conversion, because the graces are there, especially Holy Week graces. They're there for me to be kind when I'm not kind anymore, to be more patient with my neighbor, to be more loving, to love my enemy, to forgive when it's hard to forgive, to, to trust in the Lord. Those are the things that Lent should give us. And that's true love. I love you. Bye now.